be ready for dawn of that day. We'll join in singing with all the redeemed. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up the heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He is all we We've been studying in the book of Matthew and looking at the Sermon on the Mount. So I'll draw your attention today to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to read a number of verses. Chapter 6, verses 1, that should say 1 to 18. But it says 1 to 8, but we are going to read up to the end of verse number 18. It says this, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward." 
But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will Himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. But to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Father, we thank You for Your Word today. We thank You for the red lettering words of Jesus Christ. And we ask that as this Sermon on the Mount is applied to our hearts and to our souls, we pray that You would help us to become more like Him, like Jesus, in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we've been going through many different topics in the Sermon on the Mount. And as a summary review, we've talked about what salt and light is. We talked about how we are to be an influence to the people around us. We talked about how our life is an open book per se. And how people are watching us and they're reading every word that we say and every behavior that we demonstrate. We talked about the world that we're living in, how it's decaying and continuing to become more decayed, and it's dark and getting darker, and and we understand that just from watching the news uh, every day. And um, we talked about light. Its purpose is to illuminate how light and darkness cannot occupy the same space. We looked at the Beatitudes, and the first four talk about the inner man, and the last four talk about the outer man. We talked about what light is, and how God is light, and His Word is light, and how Jesus Christ is light. We talked about what it means to do good works and how we're not supposed to do good works so that people will recognize us and give glory to us and applaud us and pat us on the back. Everything that we do is all about doing it for the kingdom and for the glory of God. And we talked about what that means. We talked about what it means to be a Christian more than just in name only. It's easy to say, hi, I'm a Christian, but it's harder to say, hi, I'm acting like a Christian or behaving like a Christian. And We talked about that. We talked about Jesus, how He came to not abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. We talked about how our attitudes need to be in check and our attitudes need to be in the right direction and the right place. There were six different things that Jesus mentioned talking about committing murder. It's not just about plunging the knife, but it's about the hate that is in people's hearts. We talked about you should not commit adultery. It's not about the act of union physically itself, but it's about the the lust that goes on in the mind ahead of time. We talked about divorce and how it is um, something that God does not look upon favorably and how marriage needs to be looked at as the respectful union between one man and one woman. We talked about making oaths, which is simply being a person of your word. When you say yes, it's yes. When you say no, it's no. And and so on and so forth. We talked about loving your enemies. And uh, that was a hard one to talk about. We looked at that one a little bit more in depth talked about going the extra mile and not just doing the bare minimum, but going 
above and beyond what is asked of us, especially things that are asked of us by God the Father. And then, like I said, we, we looked a little bit more closely at what loving your enemies really means and, and, and blessing those who hate you and loving and praying for those who persecute you. We talked about that. Which brings us to today. There's a story of a very poor man who would sit on the street corner of a very busy street in a city. And as he would sit there, and the traffic would go by and the wind would blow, the dust, the debris, the ashes created a very a fine film of filth. A fine film of dirt upon him. And he sat there day after day and people walked by him and not too many people paid attention to him. But one day a woman came up and she had a camera. And for one reason or another, she decided that she wanted to take his picture. Maybe she had a collection of pictures and and she felt that him sitting there was appropriate for her collection. And so she, she pulled out a few coins from her pocket and she laid the coins into the beggar's hand. And she said, can I get a picture of you for my collection? And as the, the man took the coins into his hand, he said, sure, sure, you can take a picture. Just, just wait a moment and let me rearrange my dirt. And you know, like this story, there's a lot of rearranging of dirt going on in the world today. There's a lot of fixing up for the photo so that things will look better than they really are. There's a lot of hiding the truth so that no one will know what is really going on. And in the world of television and media, it's called fake news. But you know, I suppose like this man, we all do a little bit of rearranging of our dirt now and then. In fact, there are some times when we do it and we don't even realize it. Does someone ever come up to you and say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? And the cliche that will roll right off of our tongue when somebody asks us how we're doing is, we'll say, oh, I'm fine. Doing okay. When really we're not fine at all. Really there are things going on in our lives that are not going well. And you know, it especially happens Sometimes in church settings like this. We come to church and we want to make a good impression on everybody, right? We want to look like we're spiritual. We want to look like we have it all together. And so when somebody asks us how we're doing, we say, oh, fine, put a big smile on our face. And I know Dan, you sang a beautiful song for Eric and Irene earlier today. And I believe it was last Sunday I met you both, Eric and Irene, I met you at the door. And realizing what happened about a year ago this week, I asked you, how are you doing? I asked a lot of people, how are you doing? And Irene, you didn't just say, I'm fine. You said, it's hard. You said that you were struggling. And you know, We all struggle with things. We're not always fine. There are things going on in our lives that we try to cover up and we 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 fix ourselves up for the picture, so to speak. And like I said before, it it sometimes especially happens in church. We say we're doing fine, we do it amidst the problems and the difficulties that we have going on in our lives and We don't want others to know that something is is going on and we don't want others to know that we're not handling it well and that we're struggling. 
And even pastors go through difficult times and, and situations that are, that are not always ideal. And as I've mentioned before, I've, I, I worked on the district executive when I was serving as a pastor in the Maritimes. And it was a wonderful opportunity to, to, to cast vision and to work with many, many churches. But one of the most difficult situations that we were forced to deal with was to have a pastor who had had some kind of failure or problem or difficulty come and sit in the room and have to pour out his heart before us. If you've been in my office, you may have seen this book sitting on my desk. And the reason it's sitting there is because Kevin Carr was a pastor that served in a neighboring church. And through a difficulty that he experienced, and it's, it's common knowledge now because he published this book and all the information is in it, he didn't have a moral failure. In other words, his wife and, and him are still together. He had a different kind of failure. And he entitled his book, Hello, My Name is Kevin. I'm an ex-pastor. And so I've been reading through the chronicles and the feelings and the hurts and the difficulties of my friend and knowing that it's not always easy no matter what type of occupation or situations you find yourself in. And you know, sometimes people try and hide the truth because of how others might respond. You know, you, you're going through a difficult time and you, you share your heart with someone and suddenly that person insensitively will go and share that information with someone else and, and suddenly your problem becomes public knowledge and that doesn't make the situation any easier. So sometimes people hide the truth because of how others might respond. Sometimes people hide the truth because they think people won't respond at all. And they'll share their hurts with someone and, and they'll seemingly not have any concern or care. Whatever the reason. There are times in our lives when we try to make ourselves look good in the eyes of others. It's a game that Christians have been playing for a long time. It, it's a game that has a touch of the topic that Jesus is speaking about today. It's got a touch of hypocrisy in it. And the only rule that is needed in order to play this game is that you have to be phony in some kind of way. And not tell the whole truth or not completely convey what is going on in your life. And, and Jesus is addressing it here. And throughout this Sermon on the Mount we have been studying, He addresses many topics. But in this particular passage that we've read this morning, he addresses the issue of hypocrisy. And Jesus emphasized several times already that he is looking for real people. Jesus is looking for genuine people. He's not looking for, for people who are putting on a show. He's not looking for people who are putting up a good front. Who can put a smile on their face and say the right words while in the meantime, everything, everything on the inside is, is completely the opposite. And Jesus referred to the Pharisees once again as His prime example of this issue that He wants to deal with in this part of His sermon. Because he, he knows that the Pharisees were constantly rearranging their dirt for the camera. They were constantly rearranging their dirt so that they would look good in front of everybody that they came in contact with. And this is the issue that Jesus focuses on the first 18 verses of chapter 6. And really, it's an issue. The issue of hypocrisy is dealt with from start to finish in the Bible. It, it's dealt with, it's talked about in the book of Genesis. 
It's talked about in the book of Revelation as we've been studying the book of Revelation on Tuesday nights. You look at the letters to the seven churches. There were people in there who were referring to themselves as Christians, but they were not living the life. And Jesus spoke to them in a number of ways and explained what they were doing was contrary to the kingdom. And there has been hypocrisy in every era, in every situation. In fact, there were even hypocrites among the twelve disciples. We'll look at that in just a few moments. And here's what Jesus wants to emphasize. He wants to emphasize, and if you don't remember anything else from today, here, remember this. Those who carefully maintain their external appearance while leaving their internal vacant and unmaintained, they will struggle to inherit the kingdom. And the point that I made before where people say, I'm fine, that's not the point that I'm trying to make. But the point is this, that people who neglect the important things in their lives and try to cover it up are the ones who are going to struggle so much in their daily walk. I've spoken to you a number of times about working at this infamous place called Domino's Pizza. I got a call from Greg the day before yesterday. He's delivering pizza in Dartmouth. <coughs> he says, Dad, do you remember you told me the day you got a $100 tip? I said, yeah, I remember that. He says, well, I beat you. <laughs> he said he delivered 40 pizzas to a school and the bill was between eight and nine hundred dollars, and they gave him one hundred and forty dollars as a tip. He says, "There's only one problem, Dad." He says, "Any tip over fifteen dollars, we have to split it three ways between myself and the two people inside the store." So I only got forty-five bucks out of it. I said, "Well, that's still good." I said, "Greg, how do they, how do they monitor that? Because if you're a driver and you're getting a tip." What stops the driver from just putting it in the pocket and saying, well, I got a $10 tip? And he said, it's on the honor system. And at that moment, I was thankful that my son was honoring enough that he took the $140 back to the, the store and split it up and he got his portion and, and the Lord will bless him for that. But in Peterborough, there was this driver and she had this kind of car. This car it's called an IROC. I think it's a type of Camaro. Very souped up Camaro. It was red. And she worked there for a period of time and she would always bring people out to her car to look at it. It had all nice leather seats inside and and uh, she had just got a new paint job on it, and so it looked brand spanking new. And, and this one day, she brought us all out. She says, I want you to listen to the stereo system I just put in this. It was a Pioneer system with these big woofers in the back and amplifiers coming out from all different directions. And, and she played it, and not only did the windows on the car shake, but the windows on Domino's Pizza shook as it was parked right out front. And so she's playing this loud music and I went back in the store and I was, I was an assistant manager at the time and I could hear dooms, 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 dooms outside. <laughs> so she got ready for her shift. She put the sign on top of her car. It was kind of funny to see a, such a beautiful sports car with a domino sign on top of it. She got ready for her shift and she, she got all of her stuff ready and she she took the, the, the hot bag with her first delivery and she goes out to the car and she sits down, puts the pizza beside her and click, 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 click. <laughs> and so she had to get somebody to boost her. She went and did a delivery. She came back. She came back in the store, turned her car off and once again went out for her next click, 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 click. And that happened shift after shift after shift. Eventually, she got fired. Eventually, she got let go. Because her car, which is without a, a delivery car, you can't be a delivery person. You can only run so fast with pizza in your hand. Without a delivery car, she was not fulfilling her duties. And 
And she was fired because her car was all an outward show with an engine that couldn't deliver the goods. It's kind of like putting something impressive on a resume and then you can't fulfill the duties that you were asked to do. You, know, you fill out a resume, you do the interview, and the interviewer says, can you do this? And can you, oh yeah, that's no problem. And you show up for work and they say, okay, so this is part of your job description. You said you could do this. You're trained in this. Can you do it? Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that either. I know I said I could, but I'm not trained in that area. I don't think you'd keep that job for too long. It's the definition of hypocrisy. And Jesus is warning us in His sermon to not let it become a part of our lives. Where we say that we're one thing, but we can't deliver the goods through the behavior that is called upon us by the Word of God. The Greek word, which the New Testament is written in, the Greek word for hypocrite, it's quite interesting. I don't know if you can see that. But to summarize what it says is the definition for hypocrite in Greek is an actor on a stage who masks their identity and assumes a role of something they are not. It actually refers to the world of drama and acting. And so to paraphrase verse number 1 of our text, Jesus is saying this, be careful not to assume the role of righteousness on a stage before men. Don't just rearrange your dirt, but make sure that your righteousness is internal. And we need to be clear here. As Jesus is speaking through this sermon, Even though he is confronting sin, and he's doing it very effectively, with the Pharisees actually standing listening, even though he refers to some gathered as hypocrites, you know, in Matthew chapter uh, 23, he does it seven times, uses the word hypocrite seven times. Even though Jesus hates hypocrisy, And even if we go before the time of Jesus, if we go to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 5, it talks about how hypocrisy is like smoke in God's nose. You ever get smoke in your nose? We had a house fire, that's a picture, in 2006. And a lot of the house burned, but most of it was water and smoke damage. And when I went in the house afterwards with the claim adjuster, the insurance adjuster, to sort through and try to find all of the belongings that were in there, the smell, the stench of smoke was rank. You'd walk in that house for 30 seconds, and your clothes would be absolutely ruined. And so what I had to do for those three days working with the claim adjusters, I had one pair of clothes, they were my smoke clothes, and I would change in my vehicle outside the house and go into the house, deal with what I had to do, and then come out, take the clothes off, lay them over the balcony, and change back into my regular clothes, otherwise I'd stink everybody out. Even to this day, we have some items that were sentimental items that came out of that house fire. And they are in system care boxes in the basement of our house over here on Quarry. And if you open those boxes, the smell of smoke just lingers and you want to turn your face away. and, And it's very telling that hypocrisy... Scripture says it's like smoke in my nose. God says it's like smoke in my nose and He just he wants to, to turn away from it. It just does not appeal to Him at all. And so even though God, even though Jesus in this Scripture hates the sin of hypocrisy, He loves the sinner. He loves the people. 
You see, there were hypocrites in Israel. There were hypocrites in Judah. There were hypocrites in the time of Jesus. There were hypocrites in the church. One of the main reasons, or, or one of the reasons that someone might say, oh, I, I'm not interested in going to church, is because they say the church is full of hypocrites. If you can find a church full of perfect people, let me know. Because any and every church is imperfect from the pulpit to the back seat. That's just the way it is. It's not a reason to not go. In fact, it's a reason to gather together even more. So there were hypocrites in the church back then, even today. In fact, the church having been born in Acts chapter 2, it had to start dealing with hypocrites as early as Acts chapter 5, just a few chapters later. And you know the story of, of Ananias and Sapphira. If you're not familiar with it, it's a story of this couple and how they claimed that they gave a certain amount of money to the church. A certain amount of money that was due for them to give. And everybody, we, we, you, know, you, you know what tithing is, you know what giving offerings are. And so they were questioned, have you given so much to the church? And they were like, oh yes, we've given this amount. And they were caught lying because they actually didn't give that amount, but held some of it back and, and even buried some of it in their tent so that people wouldn't find it. They kept it for themselves. And when they were asked the question if they actually gave such amount to the church, they, they said, yes, we've given this amount. And, and they did it because they wanted themselves to look spiritual. They wanted their outward appearance to look like they were doing everything right. They wanted to look good in front of the religious leaders. They wanted to look good in front of God. But, and they thought that they were fooling everybody. Oh yeah, we've given to the church. But they were the fools. As their hypocrisy re was revealed, God struck both of them dead in front of the whole congregation. Not the way that you want a story to end, but it is the way that it ended nonetheless. Think about this for a moment. I wonder how many people there would be practicing hypocrisy if God were to deal with them in the way that He did in Acts chapter 5. If suddenly in this place or in any church, if someone walked in and they were questioned about something and they lied or they tried to deceive, if instantly they fell dead on the floor. I wonder how many people would think before they spoke. Cain was another actor who acted like he was worshiping God, but his hypocrisy was unmasked in the killing of his brother. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, Absalom, he embraces and kisses his father David while in his mind he was plotting his, to overthrow him and even plotting to murder him. In 2 Samuel chapter 20, Joab embraces Amasa And Amasa returns the embrace. You know, when someone comes up and gives you a hug or extends their arm to embrace, what's your natural reaction? You, you want to give, give them a hug back, right? So that happened in this story, 2 Samuel chapter 20. Joab reaches out to embrace Amasa, and, and as Amasa returns the embrace, Joab pulls out a sword or a knife and plunges it through his stomach and kills him. The impression of the hug was hidden or was, was hiding what was truly in his heart. And of course, there's the infamous story of Judas, who in his pocket, he had 30 pieces of silver. And he walks up to Jesus and greets Him with endearing words, Rabbi, Rabbi! Looking good in front of Jesus and all the disciples, that this would have been a normal greeting. Nobody would have thought two things of it. And he even goes further than that and he steps forward to Jesus and gives Him a kiss on the cheek 
which everybody would have thought, oh, that's so nice. He loves Jesus so much. When in his heart, he was thinking only about himself. I mentioned before that there was even hypocrisy among the twelve. Judas is one, but of course, Peter is another. Peter at one point said, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny your name. And yet, when given three opportunities to show his support of Jesus Christ, all three times he says, I do not know the man. And on the third time, he even cursed and swore and said, I tell you, I don't know him. Leave me alone. And at that time, the rooster crowed. Hypocrisy is this, showing spiritual fullness on the outside while the inside remains unmaintained and empty. And here's what we need to understand and realize. Whatever is on the inside will eventually come out. It can only be hidden for so long. Whatever's going on in your mind through your thoughts, it will eventually come out through your behavior. Whatever's going on in your heart, your dedication, your commitment, your motives, it will eventually come out and be demonstrated by your actions. And so that's what Jesus is trying to address and talk about here when He's talking about beware of hypocrisy. Don't be like these people who are showing one thing on the outside, but on the inside they are vacant. They are empty. And through this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking in this direction. He's talking about being a righteous people. And he talks about the character of righteousness in the Beatitudes. You know, those eight characteristics. Blessed are the, for they shall. He's talking about the influence of righteousness by being salt and light, and we talked about that for a couple of weeks. He, he's talking about the standards of righteousness in, in the six different issues he refers to that we've already looked at. You have heard, but I tell you. In other words, you have heard the Pharisees teach this as the standard. But I tell you that this is the standard. You know, don't kill. Don't be sexually immoral. Don't do these. Don't. All of these physical, external acts, the Pharisees were saying, this is wrong. It's okay to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. All that externalness. And Jesus says, no, that's what the human standard that you're being taught. Here is the righteousness standard that I want you to have. You have heard, but I tell you. And now in verses 1-18 to of chapter 6, He tells us about the behavior of righteousness. And how to put what's in our heart and in our minds, how to put it into action from the inside out instead of just dressing it up on the outside. And so in the first four verses, he warns about announcing. He warns about broadcasting. I found this picture. I thought it's pretty cool. If you get the theme of it, you have one funny looking rabbit on the right side. And from the surface of the ground, you have this huge plume of greenery. That's the outward appearance. And meanwhile, underneath the ground, you have this little itty-bitty carrot. And that bunny just happens to be standing. What do you think of that? Look at my plume. Meanwhile, the other little rabbit 
On the other side, his ears are back and he's looking kind of intimidated. And he's not standing in any kind of way to demonstrate what's going on around him. He's only got this little plume. But the thing is, is that what's underneath the surface is overwhelming. And that's how Jesus wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be pointing to ourselves and saying, look at me, look at me. Look what I'm doing. Look at this fantastic thing that I've done for this person or, or for this church or for this organization. Look at me. Really what that demonstrates is that inside there's not a whole lot going on. What Jesus wants is for us to do the work of the kingdom, to work with toil and to do our best, and let the results speak for themselves. What do you think the farmer thought when he came and pulled up these two carrots? Wow, look at all look at look at this huge carrot. That one's not even big enough to give to my pig. That's how God looks at what we do. Things that are not broadcasted. Things that are not emphasized or announced. And that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. In fact, Jesus went on to say, He said, those who announce and broadcast the good things that they are doing in order to get recognition from men, they've already got their reward. And when you go up to someone and say, look at what I've done, look at this, look at that, People are going to say, eh, good job. That's, that's the reward right there. Wouldn't you rather the reward be... In verses 5-14, to 14, He warns about praying in such a way as to sound spiritual. There was a man in my home church who at times our, our pastor was in the practice. At times he would, at the end of the service, he would call on a certain individual and just, just randomly call on someone. Would you lead in prayer to close our service? Would you lead in prayer for, for our prayer requests? And so at different times, different people in the congregation would lead out in prayer. And there was this one man when he prayed, the words just seemed to roll off of his tongue. And it sounded beautiful. It sounded amazing. I was quite impressed. Until one day, I met up with him at a gas station. And he didn't know that I was there, but he had some kind of dispute going on with someone and began cursing and swearing. And I thought, is that the same guy? You see, just because you can pray and have it sound nice doesn't mean that it's a reflection of your heart and your spirit. It might just be a practiced And so Jesus says, don't pray like the hypocrites do. They, they, with those vain, repetitious words and, and they stand there on the street corners and they just want to be heard. That's not how, I, how prayer is supposed to go. And, and so then Jesus says, here is the prayer that will show that it's coming from the heart. Our Father who art in heaven. It's interesting that Jesus also says here, those people that pray just to be heard, they have their reward. People that hear them and think so highly of them and even speak to them in such a way, that's their reward. Then in verses 16 to 18, he warns about fasting for appearances. He warns about fasting in order to just seem spiritual. He says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces 
that their fasting may be seen by others. And I don't know about you, but when I'm hungry, I can get kind of grumpy. (laughs) I can show it on my face. I can ask Wanda, when's supper going to be ready? The boys do the same thing. You know, you, 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 you have a certain countenance when you're hungry, and that's just for one meal. Just ate four hours ago. When you're fasting, you, you, you know, potentially you can go for days. Jesus fasted for 40 days. You can go days without eating. And so the reaction to be upset and angry and grumpy can come quite naturally. But Jesus isn't even saying this. Is when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they purposely disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Oh, I'm so hungry, but that's just what goes with the territory when you've been fasting for two and a half weeks. Oh, I'm so hungry. Truly I say to you, does this phrase seem repetitive? Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. As soon as they draw attention to what they're doing for the kingdom, it's no longer for the kingdom. It's now an earthly reward. But when you fast, and here's his instruction, anoint your head Wash your face. How many of you got up this morning and washed your face? Okay. How many of you put some kind of maybe cream or, or, or deodorant? I hope you put some deodorant on today or some kind of aftershave or whatever it is. You do that because you don't want to show up in church like you've just got out of bed. You do that because you want to put on you want to show to the, you know, the rest of the people around that you're, you're actually taking care of yourself. And So Jesus is saying, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And I shared with you about a good friend of mine, Pastor Luke Poirier. And in case you don't remember the story or you weren't here when I told it last time, I was hosting a ministerial luncheon in my church for all the ministers in our section. And because I had lobster fishermen in my church, I went to a couple of them. I said, hey, uh, got a few pastors coming over next week. Think we can get some lobster sandwiches on the go? And pails of lobster started to come in. So the ladies of the church, they put them together and they made sandwiches and so we, we set the tables out and the lobster sandwiches and the tea and the coffee and, and then we had some cookies and some cheese and all that kind of stuff. And I looked over at Luke, at Pastor Luke. And he was sitting there at the end of the table with his bottle of water. Just drinking away. And many times during the, the luncheon, because I wanted everybody to have lobster, I said to Luke, did you get enough lobster? Did you get it? How does it taste? He's French. I'm good. It's okay. Luke, are you sure you got enough? I looked at his plate and I knew there hadn't been anything on it. I'm good. I'm good. And immediately, rather than bothering him anymore about it, I just walked over to him and I said, He looked up, he went. That spoke a lot to me. Because he wasn't attempting to look spiritual. He was just doing something that God called him to do. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and join me on the platform again. We didn't read this portion of Scripture earlier, but it follows the Scripture that we've just looked at. I'm wondering if the worship team can prepare that song, Gentle Shepherd, one more time. But in Mark chapter 6, verses 19-21, to 
It says, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God wants your heart, Jesus wants your heart to be in such a place that you are not so concerned about the outward appearance, but that you are concerned about where your heart is. About where your mind is. About where your motives are. Because you know, people can look at us, they can look at you and I, and they can formulate whatever opinion they want. And that opinion will be based upon their own experience and the mood that they happen to be in during the day. But what should matter the most to us is God's opinion. Because here's the deal. My mom always told me from a little boy, she said, God keeps the books. And what she meant by that was that people can hurt you and they can harm you and they can slander you and they can think whatever they want about you, but God knows your heart. God knows your motives. God knows where you are in your spiritual life. And it doesn't matter what you put on the outside, God knows what's going on on the inside. And so Jesus encourages His listeners then, and He's encouraging us today, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Don't look for recognition here on earth, because the reward here on earth is, is piddly compared to the reward and the treasure that will be awaiting God's children when we see Him face to face. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy where thieves do not break in. Lyle said this before during the worship time. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy wants to steal whatever it is that you have that God has put within you. So don't allow him to do it. Set your treasures in a higher place. Work for the Lord rather than for yourself. Work for the Lord rather than for the recognition of, of men around you. Can we stand together? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you value, your heart will follow. Some people get this Scripture backwards. They say where your heart is, your treasure will be. That's not how it works. It's wherever your treasure is, where, whatever you value the most, your heart will follow it. And so, if your treasure is Jesus Christ and the things of the kingdom, that's where your heart will follow. Father, we thank You for Your Word today. And we pray that You would help us to be men and women that You have called us to be. We pray that You would help us to not be so concerned about our outward appearance before men, but that we would be more concerned and in tune with Your Spirit that desires that our hearts and our minds and our souls be clean and pure. And that can only happen through the blood of Jesus Christ applying the gift of salvation through repentance to the heart of every man and woman. And only then can we truly say, gentle shepherd, lead us in this direction. Lead us in greater things for Your kingdom. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if it's Your desire here today, without anybody looking around, and you just want to say this simple prayer or make this simple statement, Lord, help my inside to be pure. If that's your desire today, just lift your hand. I'd like to pray for you. Help my inside to be pure. I'm not so concerned about the inside, outside, but help my inside 
to reflect your goodness, your love, your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy. Father, for each hand raised in this place today, we know the struggle that goes on in our spiritual journey. We're not always successful from day to day. We have times of of mediocre days and we have times of failure. But thank You for being our gentle shepherd and leading us back in the ways of righteousness. Lord, help us to find the way that You desire for us to walk. Lord, that our lives would be a perfect reflection of Jesus Christ. 